So about a year ago, I found myself growing more impatient with the world. Little things like red lights and long lines started to grind on my nerves. I was snippier with people and asking my barista loaded questions like, what do you mean you're all out of almond milk? Maybe it was all in my head, so I decided to pay attention to these feelings. And what I quickly realized is that it wasn't just me who was snippier and more demanding. Everybody else was, too. But why? I decided to look into it. As a brand strategist, it's my job to know what brands are up to. And it was around this time I started reading more articles about personalization. You know the kind. Get me something faster, give me more colors, curate my playlists. It wasn't a new topic to me, but some of the data I came across was alarming. Like how most of us are just expecting some form of personalization these days. And we're willing to abandon a brand if we don't get it. Or when we tweet at a Fortune 500 company, it turns out a lot of us are expecting a reply within the hour. And that Gen Z consumers are now expecting brands to remember their birthdays. And then it hit me. What I had been experiencing wasn't just bad manners, it was entitlement. And the more I thought about that, the more I realized that this model we've built is unsustainable. Because no matter how fast I can get something or how many colors it comes in, we will always have to share the same set of roads and grocery stores and waiting rooms and so many other spaces where personalization doesn't apply. And maybe that's what's causing us to act out. On the one hand, we're being treated like the center of the universe. And on the other, we're being reminded again and again that we're all the same. I fear that if we don't resolve this tension between our public and private selves, that we'll only get angrier and more frustrated with each other until we ultimately lose our ability to coexist. That's not the world I want to live in, and you probably don't either, so I have an idea. Instead of focusing on choice and speed and birthdays as our go-to strategies for personalization, I want to add a new word to that mix, and that's community. If we want to have a better relationship with personalization at the individual level, we have to do a better job of creating a culture of we. A culture where we can feel justified in our unique wants and needs, but in a way that's grounded and orderly and reinforces the communal benefit behind that thinking. So how do we do that? Well, I admit I was clueless at first, but it was around this time that I started getting more involved in CrossFit. It didn't seem related at the time, but I started noticing some interesting dynamics in that space. And when I thought about the group fitness movement as a whole, which is something I've been doing my entire adult life, it dawned on me that that entire industry actually offers an ideal model for personalization. Here's why. Everything in that space is about the individual. It's about your schedule, your skill set, your accomplishments, and yet, these spaces share two very important attributes that prevent all of that from running amok. And that's what I'm excited to talk to you about today. The first is that they have rules. Now, a lot of places in our world have rules, but here's something interesting. If you've ever taken a spin class at SoulCycle, you might have seen this poster. It's in all of their lobbies. And as you can see, it governs every aspect of your experience from where you sit to how you treat the front desk, even your personal hygiene. And that part's a little weird, and some of you might think this is overkill, but if you look closely, it doesn't say that you can't enjoy in your own way and be yourself. It's just that the wise people in corporate figured out the baseline for a great experience and codified it into a framework. And what's more important is that they knew it had to be more visible and more inspiring than some generic terms of service that we all know would just get buried on the website. And it's not just SoulCycle that does this. Most gyms have rules. In fact, sometimes they're unspoken ones. Like at CrossFit, there's an unspoken rule that nobody leaves the floor until everybody is done with their workout. It might add a few minutes or a lot of minutes to your day, but it's just something we're expected to do as a show of support for our fellow athletes. 
even little things like showing up on time and cleaning up after yourself. All of these are very simple but powerful expectations that foster a culture of respect and an awareness of other people's needs that our current state of personalization isn't capable of delivering on. And you know, the interesting thing about the rules is that people come back again and again despite these so-called restrictions. In fact, they pay a lot of money to follow the rules, which tells me it's possible to build a positive community where rules function as a social glue. Now, speaking of other people, there's a second attribute to group fitness that I think we can learn from, and that's physical discomfort. I don't mean the cardio kind, I mean tight quarters. Why is this important? Well, you may have noticed that in our current state of personalization, it's never been easier to live in a self-curated universe, to the point where dealing with the outside world can start to feel optional. After all, why leave the house when the world can come to me in two hours or less? That's an extraordinary convenience. But it becomes a problem when we eventually have to emerge and re-engage with others in our unpredictable world. Sometimes these mental patterns can get established very deeply, and that transition between public and private is harder and harder to navigate. Group fitness tackles this head-on by intentionally thrusting people into discomfort. The lobbies are usually cramped, so people are bumping into each other and there's tension before class. The rooms are packed shoulder to shoulder, so sometimes you have to feel someone's skin and sweat on yours. Or they play with the room temperature so that your mind is in a constant state of adaptation. There's shouting and cross-talking and all those other annoying behaviors that you'd find in a movie theater or a shopping mall. These mind games seem trite, but they serve a very important purpose. Like rules, they provide a framework for modulating our behavior, but they're also an important reminder that personalization can only go so far. I can go to my favorite class with my favorite coach who knows my name and what I want to accomplish, but I have to get very comfortable knowing that that's happening in an environment that I can't ultimately control. Imagine how helpful that mindset would be the next time the stoplight turns red or when the almond milk runs out. It's in our collective best interest to sharpen this skill set before it's too late. Because as we all know, personalization or public spaces aren't going away anytime soon. So if they're not going away, how do we make this a reality? How do we enjoy the benefits of personalization and still hold shared obligation towards each other's well-being? I think it's a challenging but doable proposition, but it takes courage for brands to go there. And as consumers, it takes humility on our part to accept it. Not to mention that there's entire industries like air travel and banking that are just too complex to change overnight. And frankly, there's little financial incentive for them to do that right now. So we have to start small. And I don't mean running out to join a gym. What if instead we convinced more business owners and even employers to visualize an ideal experience for their people and play with these ideas of rules and space to manage expectations before the entitlement sets in. It might mean that your local coffee house gets rules or a makeover. If the ideal experience is convenience, then it should be very explicit about where people line up and how they order. It might mean removing choice from the menu Less options, so the line moves faster. Or maybe removing tables and chairs so people aren't tempted to linger, or training employees in techniques of speed. Whatever the combination, it doesn't matter. What really matters is figuring out the sandbox of needs that can realistically be met, and being transparent about that so people are bringing the right expectations to each and every experience. After that, true personalization is endless. And yet, something about that still feels like a tall ask in our on-demand world. Maybe we have to start even smaller. So here's my challenge to you. For the next seven days, 
I want each of you to think about your relationship to personalization. How are you managing your expectations? Where and why are you getting most frustrated when things don't go your way? And what emotions are coming up for you when that two-hour delivery window is closing in and your courier is MIA? If you find yourself with more impatience than acceptance, more angst than grace, I then challenge you to push back on those feelings, to be brave enough and humble enough to shift your mindset towards compassion and resist that pull towards entitlement. To remember the possibility, even for a moment, of that greater good. To not just do the lazy thing, but do the unexpected thing. For yourself, for your neighbor, and for our world. Thank you.